know if you could hear me okay. audio i'll turn that up so that is louder and i think that should be fine on that but i'm still trying to figure out my desktop audio so give me a second here can you all hear that song play or no i just stopped it but i just find out let me know. Yeah, this should be louder. I, it shouldn't be a problem for me. You should be able to hear me now. I just turned that up. I cranked that one up for that monitor there. I don't know what that big dial does there. Testing one, two. That should be louder. Okay. All right, good. Just give me a few seconds here to figure out why my desktop audio is not working. And we'll be good to go here in a little while. Yep, I cranked the audio up so you can hear me fine from that standpoint. All right, let's see here. Luke's doing some checking to find out what's going on with that. Yep, good to see all of you on here too as well. Hopefully Luke can figure that out, what's going on. I'm not sure what that is. Why I can't hear that, but uh, we'll get it straight here in a minute. Hmm. If something can go wrong, it will go wrong. <laughs> That's how it works, right? That's how it works. Now, I let's see here. I, I don't know if that's better or not. I don't know. I, I think it is. I think it's fine. Anyway, I don't think this is the problem, is it? I don't think this thing even works. Oops. But he's doing some of that. All right, anyway, I'm talking to myself and you at the same time. Let's see. They'll maybe get it figured out here in a second. Let's see if he's got it figured out here. Hold on, he said. Okay. Try turning on it now and leave it on. Okay. It's on. I hate being so quiet here. I guess I could tell you 
how things were going this week, how things went this weekend. We got nearly 2,000 tracks out on Saturday night. Or, yeah, Saturday night. We got nearly uh, 2,000 out. Remember special moments with a fun, interactive print. I think it was. Each craft print adds a black or white border and to any canvas or poster for signing, scrapbooking, for or any other DIY activity. Make your custom craft print in minutes. Upload your image. Select Guys, tell your me, margin. can you hear this? Can you hear this video at all playing? And let your family and friends do the rest. Let me know if you can hear this video that's playing. see here you can hear the video so you guys can hear the video I can't hear the video for some reason all right I'll be right back Wings as he hmm. goes. God gives wings to fly. <laughs> yeah, I'm gone, all right. 
<laughs> what in the world just happened? I thought this was running the whole time and it wasn't. My goodness. I don't know where my brain is today, but it's not working for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't get this audio to work. It's driving me nuts. All right. Anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, let me see if I can. Yeah, there is no desktop audio running. It shows it's running, but it doesn't come out. Strange stuff. I don't know what's going on. Well, I don't know. And the wind is blowing strong. Hmm. The wind but you can hear me okay on this, so that's good. And my strength is almost gone. And you all can hear the mute. You all can hear the video, but I can't hear a thing. So I don't know what the deal is. With that. Or what's going on, but anyway, I can't get it to work. I would have to reset it. Well, maybe we'll just keep going and see what happens here. I'm not sure. We can always do that. Let's see. Hmm. All right. 
Well, I guess I'll just keep going if you can hear okay. That's that's all that matters. There's got to be some error in the program somewhere here. I just don't know where it is exactly or what's causing it, but something is causing it to not work correctly. Well, I shut the music off, so you'll be able to hear me um, from now on here. Um, exactly. It's too loud from that standpoint. All right. Anyway, you can't see anything but what I'm doing here because uh, I don't have it uh, set up yet for uh, everything else. But anyway, so good weekend. Uh, preached to the folks down in at... Um, at the Halloween festival there that they had, their big parade that they had, their night parade, and we preached the Word of God to them, and they were called to repentance and to know the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which was a blessing for sure to be able to share the gospel with them. Now we come uh, to a day parade coming up here the next week, and... Um, the day parade will be a little different. And then there's there's kind of a, a gopher football game, too, somewhere uh, over there at the uh, TCF Center that we might hit on the way out because that's or on the way back because that's supposed to be a pretty crazy one. So anyway, there's a potential 50,000 fans that are going to be storming out of that place. Uh, what a good time to hand out some gospel tracts and preach the Bible to them. So... We have that opportunity to do that here this week, Lord willing. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. And then, of course, this is the 21st. So we have a few weeks to go here. And we'll be heading out for our trip. We'll be heading out for our trip to the Smoky Mountains in that area. So be praying for us. Uh, it's about, we'll be leaving on, I think it's two weeks from this Thursday. Uh, I think, but I don't know. Uh, I'll have to check the dates. We preached a message. I preached a message on Sunday that I hope you listen to. Let me let me go to that message here. Let me transition here quickly. And we'll go to that message. This one. Way down in the Christian race. Listen to that message if you haven't heard one. It talks about It talks about the weights in the Christian life, the weights that slow us down as we run the race toward the prize of the high calling. And I deal with that, all of the weights that, that uh, the possibilities and the things, obviously not all of them, but the possibilities of how that affects our lives and how that, how that slows you down as a Christian. And if you haven't heard that, then you ought to listen to that. Uh, praise the Lord, Cynthia. I'm glad it was a blessing to you. Lisa, good that you got some extra tracks there to give to your family, uh, your Catholic family. That's good. Uh, praise the Lord for that. Uh, so you be in prayer for us as we go through all these things and as we continue on uh, for the Lord and and preach the Word of God. And I was very, I, you know, it's been a while since I've I've felt that kind of liberty when I preached on Sunday. I really felt the liberty of the Lord when I preached that message, and I was very blessed by that. Um, and I, I think everybody was was blessed by that to to hear that at, at church, uh, to help them with their walk, you know, to help us. And I'm going to continue on with that series 
of of the Christian Race series. I'm going to preach more of those coming up. This Sunday, I'm going to talk about besetting sins, the sins that does so easily beset us. We're going to talk about that this week. And then, I think Sunday the 3rd, which will be uh, my last time preaching for about uh, 10 days or so, then I will preach a message, Lord willing, I want to preach on running with patience the race that is set before us. So running with patience will be the, the next one that I preach in that series, I believe, after the besetting sins. Uh, did I find my wallet? No, I did not find my wallet. And I canceled all my credit cards. I went and got a new license this morning. It should be mailed to me soon. I had to get a new concealed carry permit because I lost mine. Well, it was lost with my wallet. Um, let's see, what else? I had, yeah, I had to cancel all my IDs, all my credit cards, everything else, and start over. So that wasn't fun. But there was nothing I could do about it. I had to get it done. So that's the way it goes. That's the way it goes. So anyway, uh, not fun, but that's life. But you continue to pray for us as, as uh, we continue to serve the Lord here and uh, as we feed the flock of God. Yeah, it wasn't very much fun. But that's life. That's the, the way it is. There's nothing I could do about it. Yeah, patience in the race. That'll be an interesting one as well. Uh, the besetting sins ones will be helpful to you and, you know, we look forward to it. And tomorrow, not tomorrow, Wednesday, we'll be in the book of Acts again, Acts chapter 7. We'll finish up probably with Acts chapter 7 this week and move on to the next to the next uh, chapter. So as we continue on in, in uh, no, my Social Security card wasn't in there, so that was at home, but which is fine. Yeah, it's a bummer, but it is what it is, so I, I can't, I try not to think about those things too much because they just get you down if you think too long about them, so I just have to move on with it and, and continue on in the Lord and and uh, try to, I don't know, I, I don't know where it went, so I it's just, sometimes too when you have anxiety and, and depression issues and things like that, your memory there's part of your memory that that it just kind of takes, but I don't believe I left it anywhere. So I think it just fell out of my coat or something. But anyway, no way for me to tell that. So I just move on and don't worry about it. But anyway, so keep uh, up to date on these sermons. And, and if you're if there's something, sometimes they go on sermon audio a little bit quicker. Sometimes it just depends. But if they do, you can catch us on Sermon Audio as well. Not to mention all of the <laughs> the back sermons that are up there for many, 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 many years. Lisa told me she's been listening since 2012. I was pretty shocked by that. But... Praise the Lord. So it's hard to believe. I keep forgetting I'm not that young, so people have been listening for a while. Uh, I always think of myself in my 30s still, <laughs> but I'm not. All right, well, you know what? We're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit today or the false doctrine that the Pentecostals and the Charismatics hold to of the baptism of the Holy Spirit And unfortunately, it bothers me that I can't use this function here properly with my videos, so I'll have to see how I'm going to do that. I don't understand why that won't work. Um, there's always something wrong. It is a Windows, so. You never know with Windows, right? With Microsoft, there's always something that's going to go wrong. But I'm glad you've heard some of those other series that are out there. 
Uh, the Christian Life series is a good series. If you haven't heard that, uh, that that series I preached many years ago. I might have preached that twice, actually. I don't remember. But I'm glad that you listened to the Heart series. That is a good, very convicting one. Yes, the charismatic movement. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, are we in the thick of it here, right? As we talk about the charismatic movement, we're going to move on. Uh, Again, this is David Cloud's book, and uh, I got some criticism from some of those charismatics. They don't like the fact that um, I use these materials. But anyway, this is the Pentecostal Charismatic Movements, the History and Error. And the next one we're going to come to here is the error of their false baptism of the Holy Ghost. And we're going to deal with that series, uh, or we're going to deal with that subject because it is a very important one. Amy, uh, by the way, Amy says, did you... Hear that John MacArthur told Beth Moore to go home. Yes, and I thought that was extremely funny and accurate. And it takes guts to say that. For any man in ministry today to say that. Especially a ministry that size. So kudos to him for that. I have some problems with him on some other things, that's for sure. Uh, that I just can't wrap my brain around why he holds to. But anyway, not my problem, not my ministry. I don't have to answer for him. I have to answer for me. Amen? So that's what we have to do. We have to answer for what what the Lord teaches us. All right, here we go. We reject the Pentecostal charismatic movement because of the false doctrine about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to get into this today. Uh, We've all seen their their videos about fire, 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 and their their baptism of the Holy Ghost um, teachings that they teach on and how they, they want that to be some kind of emotional, physical, or spiritual experience. Well, Charisma Charles, that's pretty much the most unmanly thing that you could ever say. I cannot stay sub to your channel considering you are judging another group of fellow Christians. Well, the Bible says to judge righteous judgment. The Bible says to judge righteous judgment. So if I'm to judge righteous judgment, I'm to judge that. It also says that we are to, we are to know sound doctrine. We are to judge sound doctrine. We are to judge doctrine according to, the, to try the spirits whether they are of God. Just because somebody says they're of God doesn't mean they are. Just because somebody says that that uh, that they they got a word from God and all these other things, if it doesn't match up with God's word, then there's a problem there. So. All right. From the beginning, most Pentecostal denominations have taught that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an experience that must be sought. Subsequent to salvation, that is accompanied by tongue speaking. So there's doctrines in here that this is what they hold to. This is what they say. For example, the Assemblies of God Statement of Fundamental Truths gives the standard Pentecostal view. All believers are entitled to and should ardently expect and earnestly seek the promise of the Father, the baptism in the Holy Ghost, and fire. According to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, this was the normal experience of all in the early Christian church. With it comes the endowment of power for life and service, the bestowment of the gifts and their uses in the work of the ministry. This experience is distinct from and subsequent to the experience of the new birth. Now that's a lie. That's a lie. And what they've said is, they, they, have, they have said that this is, this is every Christian's experience, or should be. But God's Word doesn't say that. It doesn't say that this is to be every Christian's experience. That's not what it says. 
The Anglican charismatic Michael Harper says this, I believe we can see the distinction as two operations of the one Holy Spirit, regeneration and the empowering by the Spirit in the first. The Holy Spirit comes to give new life and new birth, while in the other, while in the, other the Spirit anoints or empowers Christians for their witness and ministry. It is baptism in the Spirit, which has initiated millions of Christians in the life of renewal. Royal power, once we have received it, leads us into the new dimension of Christian living. These wonderful gifts, page 28, 29, and 33. Now, again, that's not true. That isn't what God's word says or shows. It reminds me of the video of T.D. Jakes casting out the spirit of suicide. I called him out! And he's just screaming and he's yelling and he's hitting that guy upside the head. Right? Here's the answer to the, the Bible answer. The baptism of the, Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit was a historical event that was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. It was prophesied by Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. Let's go to John chapter 14. Jesus said this was going to happen, right? But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. That's what Jesus promised, that he would send the Spirit. Verse number 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. There you go. How about John chapter 16, verse number 7 through 17? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the Prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. A little while, and you shall not see me again. And again, again, a little while, and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. This is the promise of God. That's what this is. And after his resurrection, Jesus told the disciples that the time for its fulfillment was near. Let's look at that, Acts chapter 1. Hope you're following along in your Bibles and paying attention here. Acts chapter 1. The promise is given. The promise was fulfilled. Verse number 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Number two, though Pentecost was never repeated, the reception of the Holy Spirit was in three parts in the book of Acts. For the Jews, we find it in Acts chapter 2. 
For the Samaritans, we find it in Acts chapter 8. And for the Gentiles, we find it in Acts chapter 10. The special coming of the Holy Spirit beyond the day of Pentecost upon the Samaritans and the Gentiles was to demonstrate to the Jews that God was doing a new thing that was creating a spiritual entity composed of Jews and Gentiles. So, see, what he was, God was showing them. See, the Jews, those saved Jews, they had to be showed that this was the work of God. That all of it was the work of God. And had they not been showed that, they would not have been able to continue in the work. That's how God made them. In Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a backstory to this that you have to understand as you read the scriptures, as you follow through. You have to be able to kind of understand what's going on here, what's being taught here. And if you understand the narrative of what takes place with the Samaritans and the Jews— then you will begin to understand the work God was doing and how the Lord Jesus Christ did it through the Holy Ghost. The Samaritans were despised by the Jews because their religion was a mixture partly Jewish and partly pagan. Samaria had been the center of idolatry in the northern tribes of Israel. Remember that? uh, Jezebel and all those other things that were going on. When Samaria was taken captive by the king of Assyria, pagans from other lands were brought in to populate it, and the Old Testament Jewish religion became intertwined with paganism. Uh, 2 Kings 17. Let's go there. Okay. 2 Kings 17. All right, verse number five and six. Then the king of Assyria came throughout all the land and went up into Samaria and besieged it three years. And in the ninth year of Hoshea, the the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Hala and Habar by the river Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. So Israel was under the captivity there and the pagan religions became intertwined with the Jews. Thus the Jews hated the Samaritans and the Samaritans hated the Jews. When Jesus conversed with the woman at the well in Samaria, she said, how is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. All right, now stop here. I hope you're paying attention here. I'm going to put me in the wide shot here, going in the wide shot right now. So you're paying attention here. Listen, the Samaritans, the Samaritans and the Jews had no dealings. So what would it take but a move of God and the move of the Holy Ghost to prove to them that Samaritans could be saved and part of the body and they could be in one church with them, with the Jews, all saved by the same spirit. Make it sense? Then the Jews, so they hated the Samaritans, right? By treating the Samaritans in a special manner in Acts 8, God demonstrated to the Jews that he loved the Samaritans too and was putting them on the same spiritual footing when they believed in Christ. And God also demonstrated the Samaritans that salvation is of the Jews. By waiting to impart the Holy Spirit, until the apostles from Jerusalem laid hands on them. God was showing the Samaritans that they must accept the Jewish apostles as his representatives. 
the fact that there was an interval in time between them when they believed and when they received the Holy Spirit was not accidental and was not an example for the entire church age. It had to do with special situations that existed there. There was a special move there. Why? Because there was a lot of enmity. There was a lot of enmity, excuse me. There was a lot of enmity between the two groups. There were religious, racial, and cultural barriers between them. They hated each other. When the shortest route in a journey would mean passing through Samaria, the Jews, unlike the Lord Jesus, would not hesitate to lengthen their trip by going the long way around. The Samaritans, make no mistake about it, gave as good as they got. One evening when Jesus and his disciples stopped in the little Samaritan village with the intention of spending the night there, no one would take them in because they were heading to Jerusalem. Turn to Luke chapter 9, verse number 52. Watch this. You can see where the animosity is between them. And sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Look at this. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirits ye are of, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So here's the thing. What we have here is a difference that takes place. We have the Jews who are told to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay? Now, if you were a Jew and you got saved by the grace of God, but you had no dealings, you had no dealings with the Samaritans, and the Samaritans had no dealings with you. How are you going to, how is that going to be broke down? How are you going to change four to 500 years of animosity that's in the blood of those people? Earthly speaking, it's not possible to do. Earthly speaking, it wasn't possible to stop that animosity, to stop that enmity, to stop that hate. It wasn't possible. So, what had to happen? God had to move. God's spirit had to move and show forth and show forth I really think this board guy is like somebody else And that's why he's gone. See, I think he's somebody else, but whatever. Anyway, he's gone now. So I'm done with that. Exactly, Lisa. It's a language. And I'm not going to sit there and have this debate. These guys, having them argue. It is languages that are spoken. Can God, can God make it possible today? Is it possible for the Lord to 
make me speak Chinese to somebody? Yes. But it's not, it's not mumbo. It's not flipping and flopping around. It's not any of those things. What is it? It's an actual language. Is God able to do that today? Of course, God is able to do anything besides contradict his word. God is able to, I I already know who I think that is. Okay, that guy on there. All right, I, I already know who I think it is. But whatever, I don't even care. Those guys need to give it up. Let's get back to the teaching though. Let's not let a bunch of trolls ruin what God is doing. God, we're, we're trying to learn something here, and, and let's, not, let's not let that happen. Let's not let, get distracted. Let's not let the devil ruin that, okay? Because that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to distract from the teaching. He doesn't want you to learn anything because he wants you busy arguing with trolls on the side and, and, and getting into it. Let's not let that happen. I absolutely 100% believe that God is able. If I was sitting next to somebody that was Chinese— God could touch me and make me speak Chinese. Of course he could. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. But it's a language. Right? It's a language. So I I don't think there's really any debate about that. Could I verify if somebody said they did that? No. Could I believe it? Probably not if I didn't see it. I don't know who they are. They could be lying for all I know. But God's able to do it. Right? Amen. Amen. So I don't think there's any debate whether we believe that God is able to do any of those things. I think all of us believe God's able to do that. Um, anyway, so let's get back to the lesson here, okay? So think about these Samaritans with me, if you will. Uh, let's go. Let's look at a. Let me see if we can get an a map here. Uh, let's let's try to do that here, okay? Let me see here. Oops. Let me go over here. Let's see. Um, All right, let's look at. Let's see. Here we go. Let me switch you over here. So here you go. All right. Let's see if we can get in here to look at this map. All right. So these are some maps here of of Bible times, okay? And we have, let me see which one, let me me go back. There we go, right here. Here we go. Okay, so here's Samaria right here. Here's Samaria right here. Understand, and here's Galilee, here's all the, here's Judea, here's, so you have these areas here. You got a problem. Okay? You have a problem here. What's the problem? Well, here's the problem. All these people, oops. What happened here? There it is. All these people hate each other. They all hate each other. Right? Well, something's got to happen here. Right? Are you following me? Are you with me? Something's got to happen here in order for all these people to get saved by the grace of God, but to know that it's God doing this work. Something's got to happen. So what is it? God's Spirit. He's going to baptize them in the Holy Ghost, and he's going to give them, the, he's going to allow them to speak in tongues and different things like that. Why? To show them the power. Of God. All right. 
They were religious, racial, and cultural barriers between them. They hated each other. So, you know, Jesus is with them, and they want to call down fire from heaven. When they come through the, the Samaritan uh, to, to the well there, uh, or when Jesus is coming through, the sons of thunder, man, they want to bring the hammer down. They're like, let's call lightning down. Lord, shall we just destroy these people? Shall we just kill them all? No. You know not what manner of spirits you're of. See, they still didn't get it until they got the Holy Ghost. When they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, they started to get it. And then when they saw evidence of those people, then they got it. Oh, well, that's the same work that happened with us. That's the same thing that happened to us. The Jewish disciples wanted to emulate Elijah. They asked the Lord, wilt thou that we command the fire to come down? They wanted to be like Elijah. Man, let's tear him up. Hmm? So had, the, so had the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit at the moment of conversion. In that state of mind, the terrible abyss that separated them would have continued into the Christian church. It would have been a negation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit of which it is written. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. The Samaritans had to be brought to admit that what was happening with them was not a Samaritan Pentecost and that there was only one birth of the church. The Pentecost in Jerusalem was the beginning of a new era, whereas the evangelization in Samaria was only their entering into the blessing of that era and not the inauguration of it. The episode in Samaria was part of the church's growth and not its birth. It was vital that all those present in Samaria should know that there were not two bodies, right? There weren't going to be there wasn't going to be a Samaritan church and a Jewish church. No. They were going to be all into one body. They didn't have to have separate groups in that sense. They were all to be one. Right? There wasn't a different gospel for them. They didn't have a different Pentecost. No, they all had to be one in that sense. So there was no more en enmity between them. Christ and the Holy Ghost descending upon them was to be the end of the hatred and the fact that they could be into one body. Right. Right. It was crucial that the Samaritans acknowledge what Jesus had said to the Samaritan woman. Salvation is of the Jews, as well as recognize the authority of his apostles, the dispositories of the truth. The interval, therefore, between the moment the Samaritans received Christ and when they received the Holy Spirit is not accidental. It was deliberate because just as the Samaritans had to see that they were dependent on the authority of the Jewish apostles, it was equally necessary for the apostles... Those same apostles who wanted to pray for the fire of heaven to come down and incinerate the Samaritans to understand that these people with whom they had only a very brittle relationship were to enter into the same church, have the same Christ, the same salvation, the same God, the same Holy Spirit. By doing things in this way, the Holy Spirit brought down the barriers of bitterness and destroyed the separating wall right from the start. All the same. See that? They'd be all the same. They wouldn't be different people. Different groups. Samaritans, they had to see that. By the way, that, that was from Fernand Legrand, all about speaking in tongues. Quoted out of David Cloud's book. Now, in Acts chapter 10, the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit. 
The Gentiles, of course, were hated by the Jews even more than the Samaritans. Thus, God gave a special demonstration in Acts 10 to the Jews that he was accepting believing Gentiles on the same spiritual footing. On this occasion, he gave two signs to the Jews. Peter's triple vision and tongue speaking. In the account in Acts 10, it is obvious that Peter was still reluctant to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, even though he had seen the sign of tongues on the day of Pentecost, and had, and had even preached on the day on that day that God was going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh, and that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Lord Jesus Christ had commanded the Jewish disciples to preach the gospel to every nation. But the chief of them were still hesitating in this matter because of their deep-seated racism and spiritual pride. The vision that Peter saw in Acts 10, 9 through 16 was given to prepare him to receive the Gentiles and to stop looking upon them as unclean and outside of God's love. And it had its intended effect. Because of this vision, Peter was willing to go to Cornelius and to preach the gospel to him and to his Gentiles. Friends, but it was the sign of tongues that fully broke down the barrier. See, it was the sign of tongues that the Jews saw that the Gentiles and them both had that. That showed them there was no reason that God had not accepted the Gentiles. And what do the Jews do? The Jews seek a sign. They seek a sign. They have to have it. Remember when Paul was accused of bringing Greeks into the temple and all this and uncircumcised people and all these other things? Well, the reason for that is because the Jews had no dealings with Samaritans or Gentiles. They had no dealings with them. So that's why they went after Paul because they said, oh, he brought this in. It was an easy accusation against Paul. So they could put him in bonds and put him in prison. But when they were saved, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. They spoke in tongues. And they taught them. that they too that they too could be would be saved in the same body <clears throat> while peter yet spake these words the holy ghost fell on all them which heard the word and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that for the Gentiles, all, that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Acts chapter 10, 44. Now let's go there. I want you to look at that verse. See, this isn't hard, folks. Look at this. Peter is preaching to Cornelius. Peter is preaching to Cornelius and his whole house and his friends, and they get saved by the grace of God. The Holy Spirit falls on them. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. They, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now look at what Peter said. While Peter yet spake these words, look at that. So here's what they said. Now 
they said, wow. In other words, <laughs> I'm being, I'm, I'm um, obviously not giving a word-for-word -word translation here. But they were astonished, it says. As many as came with Peter. Why did they note they of the circumcision? Why did they note they of the circumcision? Because that's the first time that Gentiles were allowed to do that. And, they, and God was showing them the power. That's what it was for. Not with these stinking tongue flappers, by the way. Let me break in for a second here and say this. I do want all the charismatic trolls to know I will not stop preaching against your foolish nonsense. You can make false accounts up. You can troll. You can do whatever you want to. It only proves that you're scared of me. You're scared of the God that I serve. You're scared of what I preach. You are scared to death that this is going to reach your family and friends. And they're going to figure out that they've been following a bunch of foolish nonsense and heresy. They may even get saved by the grace of God, have their lives changed, not think that they have to run around like a bunch of idiots speaking nonsense and feeling burnings in their bosoms and getting the baby out. They'll actually be born again. They'll follow the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll they'll speak the things that have sound doctrine that are in the word of God and they won't be carried away with your foolish nonsense. That's what you're afraid of. And you're terrified of it. And you know what it does to me? It makes me want to preach on it more. It makes me want to explore, e e expose more of your foolishness. I want to do it more. I thrive on it. I thrive on your resistance against it because it shows me that it's Satan's resistance against God's word and it makes me want to fight it more it doesn't wear me down it only is like saying sick him and I just want to sick it and and I want to go after it and I want to annihilate it and I want to destroy it and I want to prove every single false thing that they do and I want to annihilate it in front of everybody and show them that these things are not in the word of God, that God's word is very plain and clear and it's not based on your emotions your feelings, your voices that you hear, your burning in your bosoms, or your word of knowledge, or, or your fake, false, sinless perfection when most of you are stuck into pornography and witchcraft, and you're doing all this stuff in private, and, and, and you run around and act like you're perfect, and you don't sin, and you don't do all these other things. I, I'm not going to stop doing this. Don't you get it? Like greater men and scarier people than you have tried to get me to stop doing what I'm doing. And by God's grace, it never worked. And I'm still here doing it. And I'm not going to stop until God takes the breath out of my lungs and I'm gone off this planet and I'm in glory. But I'm going to keep doing it. So keep sending your trolls if you want to. But I'm not stopping. Do you get that, EJ Love? I'm not stopping. Do you get that, cameraman? I'm not going to stop. Do you get that with your little fake Facebook post about me and your fake stuff? I'm not going to stop. I, I'm not going to. Your whole page dedicated to Spurgeon being a Mason and all the other weird stuff? I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep going. Because you know Why? When you hover over the target, it's pretty clear you're over it. When you throw the stone and the dog yelps, it's pretty clear I hit the right mutt. So I, I want you to understand. You got. I, I just want to give you that. So if, if you keep doing it, go ahead. I'm going to keep doing it too. But you're all a bunch of fakes and frauds. And because your wife speaks tongues... In, par in private, because your wife speaks in tongues and you're scared to tell her that she's wrong? Not my problem. Not my problem you're afraid of your wife. 
Not my problem you don't want to admit that you guys are false. Not my problem. Not at all. Don't bother me. I'm just going to keep going. I just want you to know that I'll get through this teaching and I have all the time. I'll I'll stay an extra hour. I don't care. Don't matter to me. I'll keep going. But just because your wives speak in tongues and you don't know how to put them in their place, don't get mad at me. Don't don't get mad at me. I'm just the preacher. Don't get mad at Spurgeon. He's dead. So, anyway, I just thought I'd share that because they make their little pictures up about me and make me look like Spurgeon and all these other people. And I think it's funny, actually, because I like Spurgeon. I thank God for a man like him. Way better than than, than uh, Charles Finney and the heretics that these charismatic nut jobs follow. Anyway. So, I just wanted to get that out. Now, there we go. Because they all make their little videos about me and say I'm blaspheming the spirit. No. No. I know who the Holy Ghost is. He's found in his word, and he's in me. I know what you guys do is a side show circus that has no power. And see, if if I wasn't somebody that worried you, you wouldn't be trolling me. You're trolling me because you're scared of me. You're scared of what I preach. That's why you're trolling me. I don't go troll you. I don't care what you're doing. People just tell me all the time what you're doing. But get in. Oh, another thing. For the next Jason Cooley Exposed video, pick a number. Get in line. I've seen it all. I don't care. I'm not stopping. God called me. I'm going to keep going. Praise the Lord. Here we go. Okay. You ready? All right. Observe that it was a sign of tongues that astonished the Jews, showing them, as it did, that God had definitely and unmistakably saved these believing Gentiles and bestowed upon them the Holy Spirit. The tongues on that occasion was a sign to the Jews, just as Paul explained in 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14, 20 through 22. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians 14, 20 to 22. Brethren, be not children understanding. How be it in malice be ye children, but understanding be men. In the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Oh, Amy, I know I stepped on a, uh, I stepped on a nerve. I hit a nerve, man. I hit it good. I know. I if there's anything that God's taught me how to do with preaching, and the reason why He called me is because I know how to touch that thing that they don't like. I know how to get to them, and they can't stand it. They don't like it because I get to them. I get to their little pet sins and their little hidden pornography and all their little other things that they're doing. I get to it, and they don't like it. Amen. And by the way, if this ministry was so unimportant, they sure wouldn't be trolling it. They sure wouldn't care that much. What do you care about a little church in Northfield, Minnesota for? <laughs> I love it. 
Oh, I love it. Oh, man. <laughs> Thus, Peter associated the event in Acts 10 directly with that in Acts 2. In this manner, the Holy Spirit showed conclusively that he was offering the gospel to all people and was placing both the Jews in Acts 2 and Gentiles, Acts 10, into one spiritual body, Ephesians 2.16. Let's go there. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Bernard asked the question, Bernard Christopher, what's wrong with Charles Finney? Oh, I don't have enough time to tell you how bad of a dirty, rotten heretic he is. But stay tuned. I will. And that'll bring me another big group of enemies. All right, Acts chapter 19, verse number 1 through 7. The last occasion of speaking in tongues in the book of Acts is in chapter 19. Paul found some men who had been baptized with John's baptism but did not have the Holy Spirit. Apparently he observed something about them that made him question whether they were true Christians. And after preaching Jesus Christ to them, Paul baptized them and then laid his hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. It is common in Pentecostal and charismatic circles to treat this passage as a proof text for the doctrine that baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that occurs after salvation and is accompanied by speaking in tongues. For the following reasons, we reject this interpretation. So listen very closely because we're moving into a different phase of this of understanding. We're going to move into the phase of this to deal with the Acts 19 issue because that, that comes up with a lot of people and they try to use that issue as one to try to promote this second blessing. First, it is obvious that the men had not believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, but had only believed in a corrupted version of John's Baptist, John the Baptist's message. See, they didn't know the gospel. Those guys were lost. They weren't saved. When you read Acts chapter 19, verse 1 through 7, let's go there. Let's remind ourselves of this, okay? Let's go there. Acts chapter 19, 1 through 7. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. So we understand this. So first, it is obvious that these men, had not, they didn't believe the gospel. These men were unsaved. Though they had been baptized with John's baptism or unto John's baptism, it says. For one thing, John preached salvation through Jesus Christ. So look, let's look at John 1.29. This is how we know that those people, those guys weren't saved. Look at John 1.29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Right? So here we have him preaching 
preaching Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Amen. So these guys didn't know that. They just had some quasi-baptism of John the Baptist. The Bible never says that John baptized them. It doesn't say that. People assume a lot of things about that, but it doesn't say that. But these men did not understand this salvation, apparently knowing only the ritual of baptism without its significance. Further, John preached the coming of the Holy Spirit in Matthew 3.11. Watch this. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That's John. That's John's preaching. They didn't even know who the Holy Ghost was. They didn't know. So does that sound... Accurate? That's why they needed to be saved. I don't want to turn this into a discussion on the side here about Charles Finney. Don't worry. I'll get to him sometime soon. Don't worry. It'll come. Believe me. Second, observe that the laying, oh, let me back up here, sorry. The men in Acts 19 were immigrant Jews who had heard a semblance of John's message and had been baptized but had never believed, never heard or believed the gospel of Jesus Christ and were not in association with the believers in Ephesus. Second, observe that the laying on of hands was by an apostle. This pattern cannot therefore be followed today since there are no apostles. So, their baptism was not accurate. What they had received or what they were doing was not accurate. What they'd accepted. And there are no apostles today. So this baptism of the Holy Spirit that they push today, there are no apostles. They don't have apostolic authority. Reminds you of the Roman Catholics, so they think they do. They think they are the office of the apostle that has been handed down to them, just like the Roman Catholics, just like the charismatic renewal. It's all connected. It's all one movement. That's what it is. And the Pentecostals believe they have that same authority. Thus, the situation in Acts 19 was unique. These men were Jews, and they spoke in tongues as a sign of the truth of Paul's message and as another evidence to them and to the other Jews that God was doing this new thing. Look, it was an example of what God was doing. It was a picture. It had to happen. It, they had to fall on them. The Holy Ghost had to fall on them. He had to fall on them. Show the Jews the sign that it was a work of God. And when they got saved, they were able to, they spoke in tongues and they did this. It was a sign. See, people don't like dealing with that. They don't like dealing with these signs that, that, that what the sign gifts were for. They want to do them today because God's word is not enough and they need a hippity hoppity feeling and some kind of miracle. They can't they can't believe they can't believe that the bible's enough for them they can't believe by faith they've got to have some kind of gifts 
It's an adulterous nation and a sinful people that seek a sign. Number three, there were various methods of evidences of receiving the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, but one method predominated. To say that we should receive the Holy Spirit like the Jews in the upper room on Pentecost, as they did in Acts 2, or like the Samaritans did in Acts 8, or like the Gentiles did in Acts 10, or like the Ephesians did in Acts 19, is to ignore the fact that these were unique situations that contradicted one another and that were not repeated. So here's the point. Here's the point. The point is, these guys, they want to have that apostolic authority. They want to, be, they want to act like they can pass that along. And they want to act like those three instances of the Holy Spirit falling in that way and those speaking in tongues was how everybody is supposed to. No. I'm about to show you a number of examples, a number of examples of people being saved, receiving the Holy Spirit, and not speaking in tongues, and not doing those things, not having those sign gifts, not using them. We've already talked about the fact that they were signs of an apostle. And the work that was being done there, closely associated with the apostles. People don't want to accept that today. They want that hoopla. They want to have all those other things, and they manufacture those things. And spirits will help them manufacture some things. They will. They'll help them do that. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that an interesting comment? Well, well, well. <sighs> like I said, when I'm over the target, I'm going to keep going. The Jews in Acts chapter 2, verse number 1 through 4, the Jews waiting in the upper room on the day of Pentecost received the Holy Spirit as they waited for Jesus' promise. This was in fulfillment of prophecy. When the Holy Spirit came, the evidence was a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and cloven tongues, like as a fire sitting on the head of each person and tongues speaking. If Pentecostals want to repeat Pentecost, they should expect an exact duplication of all of this evidence, but they focus rather on tongue speaking because this can be worked up and manipulated, whereas a mighty wind and cloven tongues, like as a fire, cannot. The Jews in Acts 4.4. 4. These believed the preaching of the gospel, but there is no indi indication that they spoke in tongues or exhibited any type of Pentecostal phenomena, and there is no record that they later were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts 4.4. 4. Oh, and by the way, while we're at it, let me just say this. Cooley's made a lot of mistakes in his ministry. And you know what? Pastor Cooley 
has always been man enough to admit those mistakes and those failures and repent of them for all to see and has never hid his mistakes or failures. I have openly repented of mistakes that I've made. I have said where I have erred. I have said where I've been wrong. And I have lived my, my life like that and in the ministry since I've been saved by the grace of God. I have not ran from my errors. I have not ran from what I've done wrong. But I have openly confessed those things and gotten those things right. When I've been distracted, when I've been depressed, when I've been down, when I've been discouraged, when I've been many things. I've gotten those things right. You know why? Because I have the Holy Ghost of God inside of me and the fruit and the evidence of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, when I'm wrong, I fully admit that I'm wrong. But when I'm not, there ain't a devil in this world that'll ever try to convince me to say something that is not the truth when it comes to myself or anyone else. It's just the way it goes. And you know what? I, if the Lord tarries is coming and I'm in the ministry a lot longer, I'm going to make more mistakes. That's the way it goes. But you know what? I'd hate to be the guy that runs around acting like he's never done anything wrong before. Something scary in that guy's closet. Because when you open it up, you won't want to see what's in there. A man that will look you square in the eye and tell you when he's done something wrong and will repent of it and get right with God about it. That's a man that you can respect. A man that won't do that, that's a man you can't respect, and you ought to run far from it. The Jews in Acts chapter 6, verse number 7. Again, there is nothing in the record about these believers speaking in tongues that they had to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 6, verse number 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Look at that says nothing about tongues or anything else. At, uh, the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, verse 14 to 17. These received the Holy Spirit through the laying on of the hands of the apostles from Jerusalem. This demonstrated the authority of the apostles. There is no record of the Samaritans' believers spoke in tongues when they received the Holy Spirit. Many Pentecostals and Charismatics claim the Samaritans must have spoken in tongues, but they read this into the Scripture. Acts 8, 14 through 17. Now when the apostles were at Jerusalem, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down prayed for them, they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, and they were all baptized, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. See that? How about the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, verse number 35 to 39? Let's look at that. This blows the charismatic nonsense out of the water right here. And this is what they don't like. It's all Bible and they don't like it. It's systematic Bible and they don't like it. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a, certain, unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? 
And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So here we go. We see the Ethiopian eunuch. What a miracle to see this man get saved right there, that God sends Philip right there. But what happens? He doesn't speak in tongues. There's no evidence of that there. The Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. They received the Holy Spirit through hearing and believing the gospel, and they spoke with tongues. This is one of the only three places in the book of Acts that speaking in tongues followed faith in Christ. The tongues in this case was not the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but was bold and effective sign to the Jews present that God was extending salvation to the Gentiles. This is emphasized in Acts 10 and repeated in Acts chapter 11. See how that works? Look what the emphasis is on in those. The people in Antioch in Acts 11, 20 through 21. Let's go there. Boy, this scripture really bothers him, doesn't it? And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Amen. Acts chapter 11, verse 20 and 21. We see that. Lydia and her household in Acts 16, 13 through 15. These believed and were baptized, but did not speak in tongues, and there is no record that they were baptized with the Holy Spirit at some later point. Acts 16. Acts 16, 13 through 15. And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the woman which resorted there thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple unto the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart of the, the Lord opened. And she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. No mention of tongues. None. Those who believed in Thessalonica and Berea and Athens in Acts 17, 4. Let's turn there. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. Of the end of the devout Greeks, a great multitude of the chief women, not a few. Okay, let's go to verse 12. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks and not of men, and of men, not a few. And then verse number 34. Howbeit a certain men a certain howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed among the them which among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Demarius and others with them. How about Crispus and the and others in in Corinth in Acts eighteen eight? Look, these are all examples of this. 
Though these believed and were baptized, they did not speak in tongues. They did not have a separate baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, the Corinthians were hearing believed and were baptized. How about Acts 19, the disciples at Ephesus, Acts 19, 4 through 6. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. These received the Holy Spirit by believing on Christ and being baptized and by the laying on of the, Paul's hands. This was a unique situation that is never repeated in Acts and was a sign of Paul's apostleship. This is the third and final time that those who believed in the book of Acts spoke in tongues. So, excuse me, this was the last time that they did. I don't know if I said before they didn't, but they did here in Acts 19. Um, I think we talked about this already. Anyway, but um, those who believed the book of Acts spoke in tongues. Uh, this is the third and final time that those who believed in the book of Acts spoke in tongues. In each case, the Jews were present. In this case, at Ephesus, those who spoke were Jews, and their tongues were assigned to all the dispersed Jews, that God was extending salvation to the Gentiles, and that Paul's ministry to the Gentiles was authentic. In Ephesus, Acts 17 to 19. Acts uh, chapter 19, uh, 17 to 19. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before, the fi before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. There is nothing in this record about anyone speaking in tongues or about the necessity of speaking in the, or seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thus we see that there are many ways that the Holy Spirit was received during the period covered in the book of Acts. He was received with a rushing mighty wind and cloven tongues like as a fire and tongues speaking in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. He was received by the laying on of the hands of the apostles and no tongues in Acts 8. He was received by the laying on of the apostles' hands accompanied by tongues in Acts 19. In all other cases, the Holy Spirit was received by simply believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. No laying on of the hands or tongues were involved. This conforms to the teaching of Romans 8, 9, which says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The doctrine of how the believer receives the Holy Spirit must be found in the majority of these cases. The permanent and abiding pattern is for the sinner to put his faith in Christ Jesus. And by doing so, he is saved and receives the Holy Spirit and everything God wants him to have. There is no halfway salvation in the Bible. Everything God has is in Christ. And by receiving Christ and believing on him, the individual receives everything. We see the permanent method of receiving the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, 37 through 42. The first believers under the new dispensation after the coming of the Holy Spirit, it proves that, it shows that. The law first mentioned is, important, is an important method of Bible study. These men and women received the Holy Spirit by repenting and gladly believing on the name of Jesus Christ. They that gladly received his word were then baptized. The evidence that followed the reception of the Holy Spirit was not tongues speaking or a mighty wind or a cloven tongues of fire or shaking or falling to the ground. Rather, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Here we see in Ephesians 1, 12 through 14, that we should be to the praise of, of that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, and whom he also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. 
in whom also ye that believed were sealed. With that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Let's look at that. Ephesians 2. Excuse me, Ephesians 1. Verse number 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Look at this. Look what the pattern is. In whom he also trusted after that you heard the word of the truth. You heard it. The gospel of your salvation. And whom also after that you believed. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession of the praise of his glory. Here we see the Holy Spirit is received when the sinner hears the gospel and puts his trust in Christ. The believer is thus sealed with the Holy Spirit until the resurrection and glorification. The only mention of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the epistles in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And here we see that it is something that is a reality for all believers. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. The Bible speaks of it. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. That's an there's a lot of there's a lot of dis, discrepancy on that verse, but we'll talk about that at another time. Not discrepancies far are different applications to that verse, I would say. The tongue that tongue speaking is not the evidence of being baptized with the Holy Spirit is plain by 1 Corinthians twelve. Verse 13 says that all have been baptized, all have been, and, and verse number 30 says not all speak in tongues. Thus the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurred once in the day of Pentecost, but there were special receptions of the Holy Spirit for the Samaritans in Acts 8 and for the Gentiles in Acts 10, and there were unique situations which God was showing them. That makes sense, doesn't it? It makes perfect sense. When you rightly divide it and you go through it and you don't, you don't have an agenda. But you just read it for what it says systematically. Also, it's important to understand that the book of Acts is a transitional book. Not everything that is recorded therein is a pattern for the rest of the church age. Pentecost and Charis- Pentecostals and Charismatics often talk about a book of Acts type of Christianity or apostolic Christianity. But there are many things that the apostles did in what we find in Acts that have not been done in the New Testament churches. The ministry of the apostles was unique. The apostles could lay hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit. They had special sign miracles to authenticate their ministry. We've also we talked about that. Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds, says Paul. You know, they totally do away with the epistles. They don't like those. The New Testament never instructs believers to seek the Holy Spirit or to seek to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Pentecostals and Charismatics teach that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an experience in addition to salvation. You know what? I'm going to stop there because what I'm going to do, this starts their exaltation of the Holy Spirit, that they exalt the Holy Spirit. Um. Let's see. We talked about this already. Actually, no, you know what? I'm going to finish this because we actually talked about this. We already talked about the baptism of fire before. Pentecostals, they teach that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an experience in addition to salvation. And that it must be sought by the believer. 
Michael Harper presents four things that are allegedly required for the reception of the spirit baptism. Faith, prayer, action, and, and a sign, tongues. In the early 1980s, David Cloud said, I attended a service in Nepal led by the Pentecostal prophet from England, and he urged his listeners to come forward and be baptized by the Holy Spirit. The only text that he read to support his doctrine was 1 Corinthians 12, 13. So he totally misaligns that. Two passages that are used to support the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit must be sought are Luke eleven thirteen and Luke 24, 9, uh, 49. They say this, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him? And then they use verse 24, or verse 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endowed with power from on high. Now listen. Luke eleven thirteen cannot be talking about asking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit because not one example is given of such a thing in Acts or the epistles. Luke eleven thirteen refers rather to asking for the continual filling of and the assistance of the Spirit in the accordance with the clear instructions of Ephesians five eighteen. The commandment of Luke 24, 49 was given only one time in Scripture, and that was to the disciples that met in the upper room and waited for the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Their tearing did not bring the Holy Spirit, and nothing they did while tearing brought the Holy Spirit. He came in fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The Old Testament feast describes in Leviticus 23 typified New Testament doctrine. The Passover signified the cross of Christ. First fruit signified Christ's resurrection. Pentecost signified the coming of the Holy Spirit. It occurred exactly 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. And the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 occurred exactly 50 days after Christ rose from the dead. There is simply no command or example in the New Testament for believers to seek the Holy Spirit or to seek Holy Spirit baptism or to seek a second baptism or a second blessing of any sort. It is the filling of the Spirit that is commanded. Look at Ephesians 5. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the, in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God the God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Every believer has the Holy Spirit and has been baptized by the Holy Spirit and is thus instructed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This means to yield to the Spirit's control. Every believer has the Holy Spirit. The marks associated with the filling of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians are singing spiritual songs of the Lord, giving thanks unto God and submission to one to another. There is no mention of tongues or of emotional experiences such as inner healing or shaking or falling or laughing. If the baptism of the Holy Spirit were something that the believer needed in addition to his salvation, if he needed it for power and effectiveness and sanctification, the scripture would clearly state that this and would clearly describe how to receive it. If Pentecostal doctrine were true, the apostles would have instructed the churches along this line. In writing to the carnal church at Corinth, for example, Paul would have explained to them that they needed a baptism in the Spirit or a baptism of fire or a second touch of the Spirit or something of that sort, and he would have described how they could have this experience. Instead, Paul says these believers were already enriched by God in everything. Were baptized by the Holy Spirit and were sealed under the day of redemption. Rather than instructing them about a second baptism or a second blessing, Paul instructs them about holy living. Oh, that'll get you, won't it? You want to talk about flapping your tongue all around, you Pentecostals do. You don't want to talk about sincere and true sanctification, honoring God. And suffering for Christ's sake.
Paul instructed them about holy living. They didn't need to receive the Holy Spirit. They needed, they needed to walk in obedience to the Holy Spirit. They already had. They didn't need more of the Holy Spirit. He needed more of them. They didn't need to leap over above their spiritual struggles by means of a new experience. They needed to faithfully walk in victory through their struggles step by step. They didn't need to leap by means of a miracle. They needed to walk humbly by faith. The Bible warns that there are false spirits that imitate the Holy Spirit. And we need to be careful about seeking something that the Bible does not say we should seek. The Bible warns that there are false spirits there. Try the spirits. Paul was afraid the church at Corinth because of this danger. He said in, in 2 Corinthians 11, look at this. I'm going to tell you what, you start seeking things, you'll find them. You get out of line with God and you seek something that God doesn't want you to have. You're looking for all these anointings, right? Look what Paul said. But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled at Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be, compl- uh, your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That's what's happening, friend. They want an experience. Here's the book. Oops, let me give you a close-up here. So... That concludes for today this teaching. Covers the truth about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It is not what they say it is. It is not what they teach. It is not what they practice that's accurate. What they practice and teach is a lie. And... It's amazing to me how many of these people actually hate the truth so much. And they're so worried about this type of teaching. It's the, it, but you have to understand something, okay? It's not them. It's the spirits that are in them. Well, as you can see here, look at this. Do you see this? In context, the Pharisees were, look what he says. Do you see how they're coming in trolling? Then they put on, they put on troll things to try to stop me. Like the email that you got that I, that I showed you the other day. Making up, you mean, You have to understand there's a spirit in these people. And this is a perfect example. I want you to understand something. Sane people that don't have devils, they don't have time to waste on this nonsense. Do you understand that? Like they they don't have time to do that. They don't have that kind of time. But people that are possessed by devils, they have time to make up fake accounts. And they have time to troll this. And why do they feel the need to? Because these people have devils in them. Don't you get it? That's, they're living proof that this doctrine that they hold to is wrong. And the more they war against this Bible teaching, the more it proves it's true. the more they prove it's true. By the way, the same pictures that you see on here that they've made up, a lot of those, like crossing me and Spurgeon and all those other things, those are all things that some people have on their Facebook pages, which shows you the connection that they all have. Anyway, 
And there's more than that. There's quite a few people that hate the truth out there, so there's quite a bit of them. But the point is, is that these people, they, they can't stop because they're possessed. They can't stop it. So they have to come on here and they have to oppose it. Because they want to lay their hands on, I mean, on, on other people and they want them to speak in tongues. They want them to do that. They want them to speak their gibberish. That's what it's all about. And whatever. We just keep going. We just keep going and keep preaching and keep serving the Lord. You know, but they, but they can't control themselves. They can't stop it. That's why they got to keep making up fake accounts, sending me emails telling me that I'm you're going to stop. Yeah, right. But anyway, the up they definitely need prayer. They definitely do. We all do, but they they need it. But um, anyway, so uh, yeah, it is awful. There's a lot of tongue speakers. Anyway, I didn't see anybody have any questions over here. I'll look and see. Somebody asked a question earlier. Let me see if I can find it. Let's see. Here, uh, Kirion. I have a question, Pastor Cooley. When a man is saved by repentance and faith, does he need to pray to the Lord or pray the sinner's prayer? Well, you will pray the Lord. Uh, when you repent, you're repenting to God. The Bible says repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to repeat a sinner's prayer, but in your own words, you're going to call out to the Lord. That's what you're going to do. Uh, it says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, you know, you're going to call upon the Lord in repentance and faith, in whatever words, uh, you know, the Lord gives you. You believe the gospel, you confess it with your mouth. That's what the Bible says, that we confess it with our mouth and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So that's, that's what we do. We believe in our heart, we confess with our mouth. But it doesn't have to be some scripted sinner's prayer. I'm just saying that you're going to call upon the name of the Lord. That's what you're going to do. You're going to call upon him. And the flat earthers want to ask questions, which I have no idea why. I mean, this is about the charismatic movement, but they're probably one and the same. I'd like to do a broadcast on distractions. S call it call it subverted and distractions and i'd like to do it on there and i'd like to talk about hebrew roots flat earth mandela effect and uh, every other cornball goofball thing that distracts you from sound biblical doctrine and makes you really concerned over things that really don't matter that much Yep. So anyway, absolutely. Uh, let's see. So I hope that answers your question, Kirion, that you had there. 
let's see. Uh, I'm just looking here to make sure there's nothing else on here. Mm, let's see. Oh, excuse me. Why can't you believe, why can't you agree the world is stationary? When did I say it wasn't stationary? Grew up in a Pentecostal church, praise God, no matter how many altar calls I went up for or how many hands were laid on me, never had one of those spiritual experiences. Well, that's good. Getting the yeah. Oh my. Well, anyway, I I'm I I think I will talk about that sometime because those those distractions. That's exactly what they are. They're just plain distractions that try to. They really just try to, you know, um, focus on other things, that are not sound in doctrine. That 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 don't really help you yes cern that's another one cern change my bible what my thoughts on how Lindsay is that he's a heretic or no i don't know if he's a heretic i he's wrong <laughs> his you know he's he's wrong about what his doctor his doctrine that he holds to on the pre-trib rapture, I believe, but I, I don't know what else Hal Lindsey believes. I thought he was into like some weird stuff, but I, I don't remember. Uh, wow. Who has time to make up fake accounts? Anyway, so weird. And so many of them. Anyway, um, Wednesday, probably the charismatic stuff. I might do something else. I might do uh, I might do that show on distractions, that, that broadcast on distractions. So we'll see. You know? But we'll see. We'll see what we come up with there. For that, um, let's see. Friday... I'll probably do current affairs and all that other stuff. And then busy time this weekend, of course, preaching. And I don't know who Trevor Horn is. No clue. Yep. Thank you, Brother Joe. I appreciate that. Brother Joe McDonald. Stefan, thank you. I appreciate that as well. Um, praise the Lord for that. Appreciate your prayers. You continue to pray for us. We can definitely use it, always. And thank the Lord for his provision, his, his providing. Yep, Terry, I know. I don't know what the deal is with people. It's, it's really strange, but all I can say is devils, demons. That's what it is. It has to be. Because nobody would care that much. Hey, Pastor, wondering if you could keep my coworker in prayer. He's in the hospital with a broken leg. Oh, wow. Well, definitely. Uh, yeah, we're opening a was, was that all fake? The church is in Ireland going on about KGB. Oh, I don't know anything about, I don't know anything about that. Gail Ripplinger. Uh, Uh, yeah, I don't know much about Hal Lindsey. I just know he had that pre-trip book that he had out, but I mean, I, I don't know much about him. I appreciate the prayers as well. Thank you uh, for everybody else. Lisa, it was good to meet you this last weekend, and um, praise the Lord for that, and for the cookies and the card and everything. Thank you so much for that. 
That was a blessing. And, you know, I I don't want to waste a lot of time addressing trolls and people like that, but I just felt like that needed to get out there. Um, you know, and, and tell those people just straightforward that it, we're going to keep going no matter what, and we're not going to worry about what they're doing, but we're also not going to act like it's not there. Excuse me, I keep yawning. My goodness. But um, praise the Lord. Yeah, I think Hal is a false prophet. I I, I don't know much about him, though. I, I don't remember anything about him, to be honest with you. Uh, no, I'm not pre-trib. I'm post-trib. I don't care if you're pre-trib. I mean, it doesn't bother me. I have plenty of friends that are pre-trib, and I have some that are post-trib. But um, either way, I'm still waiting for somebody to prove the pre-trib right. I'd like it. I really would. But anyway, why are Baptist churches becoming contemporary? Been trying to find a new church, and they were pondering, pandering to the youth, and also charging the KG, changing the KJV while saying they stick to it. Why? Um, are Baptists becoming contemporary? Well, they're becoming contemporary because they're trying to go along to get along. They're trying to reach the world by compromising with it. So that's why they are. They're, it all starts with the music, and then it goes into the Bible version issue. It happens very quickly. I'm not going away, troll. I don't go away that easy. I, I haven't learned anything from NASA. I've never studied NASA. I don't know what NASA teaches. Except I saw people walk around in moon boots and jump really funny in the air and, and do things. But I haven't really learned a lot from NASA. I never have. I just, I just don't understand why people are that concerned over the shape of the earth. And not over the souls of men. I don't know. No one's going to hell because they believe that the earth's flat. That's or the earth's flat or the earth's round. Nobody's going to hell over that topic. They're they're going to hell because they don't believe in the God of the Bible and Jesus Christ. They don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and He hasn't forgiven their sins. Because they haven't repented and put their faith and trust in Christ. But as far as the shape of the earth goes. I never said we were spinning. I never once said that we were, that the earth was spinning. I didn't say that. When did I say that? See my teaching on geocentricity. I never said the earth was spinning. I taught a whole two-hour broadcast on geocentricity, the answer to the flat earth. Folly. I didn't, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Not at all. Uh, yeah. I just don't know what the big deal is, why they, people lose it so much about that issue. What if it's shaped like a cube and it's cubert and like you can jump on it and jump from different blocks? Bloop, 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 bloop. What happens if that's true? Then you flat earthers are going to be really upset. I just don't know why that issue has to bring so many people out and they go so crazy over it. But they do. They go crazy over the flat earth. The flat earth. I don't know. I guess we'll just have to, you know, I I don't know. Sometime maybe I'll talk about that again. But I, I really don't like going into that issue. It's kind of.
kind of goofy flat earth issue is um i know pastor hoggard has that flat earth website dedicated to flat earthers all that good stuff i don't know man i don't know why these people can't let it go but they can't They can't let it go. <laughs> That's right, Katie Porter, it is. It's easier than walking in the spirit, spirit to worry about the shape of the earth. Okay, Joanne, I unhid you on here, but don't start a big flat earth thing, okay? I, I know you've been listening for a while, and, and I don't want to I don't want you to be off of here, okay? Um, but just just don't start a big flat earth war here, okay? I don't want you to stop listening, but I just just don't do that, okay? Um Mike knows how to spot the he tries to spot the trouble before it comes up, and he does a good job of it because he knows what's coming. But I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to keep you off here. But just, just don't, don't get into a big flat Earth uh, war here. Um, I just, I hate even talking about that topic. I guess it just brings out everything. People get so nervous about it, so uptight about it. But. Uh, That's all right, Joanne. I, I again, I, I don't, I don't want to see you go. Just, just let's not get into a big brawl about the flat Earth. Um, a lot of it is just, they're just distractions. I'm afraid. All right. Anyway, I'm gonna get out of here.